Welcome everyone to the Deep 10th Anniversary Festival. This is the first of 21 events that we're running this week to celebrate 10 years of working together to amplify the voices of people living with dementia. When we were thinking about how best to mark this year, we were mindful that we couldn't just have one big event. So we've celebrated in person at 17 deep events all across the UK. All the events from this year and this week will be recorded and available to all. We're recording now. Together, these events make up a remarkable and wonderful tapestry to be watched and shared. You won't be visible during this session, but please use the chat box to make any comments, to say hello to each other, and of course, to ask questions of Jane Garvey and the Four Amigos. Talking of which, a huge welcome to Jane Garvey and the Four Amigos. As all of you will know, Jane Garvey is a celebrated broadcaster and podcaster. She presented Woman's Hour for many years and also the wonderful and truly hilarious podcast, Fortunately, with Jane Glover. She now presents with Times Radio. So over three years since Jane came to an event that we organized in the London basement. And Jane, you wrote afterwards, that day turned out to be educational and life-changing in equal measure. So I'm now gonna hand straight over to you, Jane, and invite you to ask the four amigos to introduce themselves and get into a conversation with you about DEEP. Philippe, thank you very much. And it is a real pleasure to be able to talk to you all uh, this morning. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to see some old faces, old, fr old faces, sorry, I got that wrong, old friends, <laughs> uh, particularly Wendy and Dory, who I, I really enjoyed meeting um, at that occasion in London that Philly talked about. And when I wrote about it afterwards, I, I did mean that. I think there's a lot of, as you all know, there's a lot of fear around dementia. And that fear is something that I think grips so many of us, if we're honest. Um, we're concerned that we might develop it. We're concerned that somebody we care about might develop it. And we're also very aware often of our own ignorance. And I really found it a really, really interesting and moving day to be a part of that conversation three years ago. So that's why I'm here today and delighted to be here as well, I should say. So I want to introduce the amigos, Wendy and Dory I've met, as I say, George and Gail are new to me. So if Wendy and Dory don't mind, I'm going to start with Gail, if that's all right. Gail, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I'm Gail and I was diagnosed with the dementia about, uh, well, nearly four years ago now. Um, and I live in Lancashire, come from a little town called Cleveleys. And I've been with the deep now for about, um, two years, I think. Yeah, and it's just been absolutely brilliant. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your life before your diagnosis? You, you ran your own business, didn't you? I did run my own business. I, I had my own teddy bear embroidering business, um, which um, we had an online store and we was very successful. Um, but the, there comes a point when you're a, a sole trader that when you have dementia, it's rather difficult to um, take messages down, answer the phone. And this is when I started to realize that there was something going wrong when uh, people was telling me the orders over the telephone and I was forgetting them and having to ring them back uh, constantly. Um, figures weren't adding up and, and things like that. So that's when we decided that I'd have to take a step back. Right, and, and at the time that you were beginning to have these feelings about yourself and the way you you were performing did you speak to anybody who who did you confide in or were you slightly lonely in all this um very very lonely um didn't want to mention it to my parents because my parents are still alive so I didn't want to worry them um I spoke to my hubby about it um on several occasions because obviously he noticed that there was things changing as well but um it was do I go to the doctors? And we kept putting that off because we put it down to stress because um, we'd only just recently moved. Um, so we thought it was just stress with the house move. And that's why I was forgetting things and doing things wrong. OK, Gail, thank you very much. That's a really useful introduction to you. Um, I appreciate that. George, I think you um, are in a different part of the country. Where are you? And tell us a bit about yourself. 
Hi, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm George in North Shropshire, uh, in the wonderful North Shropshire Lakelands, uh, we have lots of mirrors to walk around. <clears throat> so I was diagnosed um, eight, eight years ago, age 63, I think it was, and uh, I had actually just about finished work because I found, I found full-time work. Uh, I was a business manager in a school and um, I just couldn't cope with it. Uh, it was too much going on. Um, and then I got some part-time work and, um, and, and then I got the diagnosis. Um, yeah, I, I, I was expecting the diagnosis, so it wasn't a huge shock for me. Um, I'd sort of done some research and I also have a couple of family members in the past who have uh, had dementia and, and really died with it. So would it be fair to say that you were, you were fearful at the time of your diagnosis or were, was there a level of acceptance <coughs> from you? There was a, a level of acceptance. I, I mean, I knew, I knew because of my health history that I was likely to have vascular dementia. Um, but what surprised me uh, and gave me a little bit of a flutter was a bad flutter, I hasten to add, um, was Alzheimer's um, diagnosis. But getting the outside, Alzheimer's diagnosis meant that I got Denepazil, the wonder drug, which wakes the brain up. And uh, it woke me up almost within 24, 48 hours. So it made a huge difference. So some years on from that diagnosis, you're still, well, I mean, you'll present to many people as, as a, a very average chap of your age, if you don't mind me saying that. Is, is that yes. how you feel? <laughs> there's, there's a phrase we all use from time to time, usually several times a day. Um, when we hear people say, you don't look as if you've got dementia, um, or you don't sound like you've got dementia. Um, yeah, I mean, we're all at different levels. We all, we, we, I'll say deteriorate, because it is, um, but it's, everybody's at different paces. So, um, I mean, I know people in my, in the deep group I run in, in Shrewsbury, who, um, two of whom have, have gone downhill very fast uh, in their sort of mid to late 60s and uh, one of whom's now died and another one is, is really really struggling well uh, dependent 24 hours a day on care so you know it, it's it's all different yeah okay thank you for for making that clear because you're absolutely right of course um, lovely to see you again, Dory. Um, tell us a little bit, bit about yourself. You're in Flintshire in Wales, and um, how are you doing today? I'm fine today. Um, I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow because I've developed a tremor. Um, but for others who don't know, it says Teresa Davis, which is that, that's who I am, but I go by the name Dory. In case people are confused. Um, we are now. Pardon? <laughs> we are confused now. <laughs> Carry Dory, on, Dory. I stepped into four amigos speak then. <laughs> um, interrupted me now. <laughs> no, I, 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 Dory... was, I was diagnosed when I was 59. Right. Um, I was a landscape gardener. But I'd already finished that career before my diagnosis after a car accident. Um, it came as a shock to me because I didn't, I'd never heard, I'd heard of dementia, but when they were doing all the tests and they didn't, nobody mentioned the word dementia, you know, that they could, it could be dementia, they were doing this test to rule it out or so when they gave me that diagnosis it was like I hit a brick wall really because I didn't know anybody else who had dementia either and they said my life expectancy would be five to eight years so it, it was horrible really and everybody started talking over me or patronizingly sort of so I did feel 
yes, I've got a death sentence. And it was until I got involved with Dee, which I think was a couple of years later, um, that I realised, now, I know it's progressive, you know, but we're all going to die sometime, aren't we? Yeah. And made loads of friends. They built my confidence up and showed me how to smile again, really. You mentioned the word patronising there, and I think that's so important, Dory. The great mm. thing about Deep, I imagine, is that it's a place where you don't get patronised, and, and that's important to you, isn't it? Very, yes. Yeah, nobody, we all understand, you know, the challenges, and we can just be ourselves and relax. And um, the four amigos yeah. were really great friends through the deep network and I don't worry about the later stages now um because we sort of educate or hopefully educate the professionals not to be patronizing to see us as a person and so I think when I come to later stages, if and when, um, as long as I'm treated with respect and dignity and empathy, which the Four Amigos and other deep groups is what we do, try and educate the future people who are coming into that um, career. A brilliantly expressed story. Thank you very much. And that brings us on to Wendy Mitchell. Now, Wendy, um, I've got to be absolutely honest with you. I interviewed you on Woman's Hour some years ago now. I can't actually remember how many years ago it was when your <laughs> first book came out. And I remember us having a meeting at Broadcasting House before your interview, um, during which I asked, well, am I, is this woman, is she going to be able to come on the programme? Is this is it sensible to have her on live radio? Will it be difficult for her or embarrassing or even humiliating? And I was assured that no, you would be absolutely brilliant. And you were absolutely brilliant in talking about dementia and talking about your life. But are you aware, Wendy, that people do have misconceptions about dementia and about what it does to people? Oh my goodness. I, even even now, eight years later, you, you think you've taken steps forward. And in fact, there are certain occasions when you think you've gone 10 steps back. Uh, I broke my wrist over Christmas. Mm -hmm. I did it good and proper. And the consultant called me and my daughter in to discuss what we thought was the operation. But the first thing he said when we sat down before hearing anything from me was, well, on paper, you don't need an operation. You've got dementia. Why do you need a left hand? And at that moment, you can imagine I was just stunned into silence. Through the shock of it all, I felt like I'd gone back to eight years ago. And... Luckily, he had the grace to back down because my daughter found her voice very quickly and told him. And then <laughs> I found my voice very quickly and told him that I needed a left hand just as much as he did. And he'd made that dreadful assumption that because I have dementia, I'm not worthy of anything. I'm not worthy of the discussion. But as I said, he had the grace to back down. And now I have a fully working left wrist, which I wouldn't have had. It would have been totally useless because I'd broken it in several places and dislocated it. And he didn't see any need to mend it. So the 
assumptions are still being made in some areas, which shows how much work we still have to do. But unless we keep doing it, and it's, it's that that keeps me going, it's the, it's the bad experiences that keep me going. The good experiences are wonderful. And I think, yes, we've got, people are getting it. But then the bad experiences and you think you, okay, let's start again. Let's repeat and repeat and repeat what I've been saying for eight years. And it's not just me, it's, you know, eight years before me, people were saying the same things. Mm. So we're continually nibbling away and sowing seeds of mm, sowing seeds of um, new concepts, new images that people can take away with them. Yeah. Wendy, I think um, that's such a powerful answer to my question, and I'm not a an answer I was expecting I've got to be honest I'm just I'm looking in the chat here and a lot of people are really shocked by what that doctor said to you as, as I am actually I mean this presumably this man didn't know that you're a best-selling author um, and that, that he did you're... before we left the room did I bet he did yes okay um I mean it, that, that is genuinely shocking um can we talk then about if you don't mind Wendy starting this section off about what deep means to you and what it's done oh. for you oh goodness deep means to me friendship of a kind that i've never had before it means that one word dementia that people fear so much has brought together so many good friends and i call them my second family because that's what it feels like it's that instant connection you feel with someone when you hear they have dementia, because suddenly you're not alone. And it's that bond of a cruel disease that brings about a closeness that I've never felt like before. When I, before, when I was diagnosed, like Dory, I thought it was the end. And I learned that it wasn't by hearing another playmate speak, the wonderful Agnes. I saw her speak on stage and she'd been diagnosed for 10 years. Now suddenly I thought, well, She's been diagnosed for 10 years and is speaking so eloquently. Why can't I? And it was at that meeting I found out about a deep group in York. But the strength it took to walk through that door, not knowing what I would find, was so immense, I can't tell you how frightened I was to walk through that door. But once I did, well, all I found were people laughing, people having a cup of tea, people chatting, and people welcoming me. And it was that instant feeling of being accepted that I'm so glad I walked through that door because I'd never come back out again. That's fantastic. Gail, um, if you don't mind, can we talk about the first time you encountered Deep? How did you find out about it and, and what has it done for you? Um, I, I was lucky enough to find Deep during the lockdown and it was only by chance by searching social media that I'd seen, um, it was actually a talk by Wendy Mitchell and I joined, um, I signed up to join and I think it was Tea with Wendy or something like yeah. that and um, that was the first ever encounter with the deep and then very quickly I got invited 
to join other things. And we had a group um, um, which was like a funster group. Um, mm -hmm. That was absolutely wonderful. And the togetherness that you feel when you're coming to these groups because you're with, with like-minded people and you don't get treated any differently and you can say what you want and you can do what you want and nobody judges you and it's just absolutely brilliant and I'm so glad that I found it because I can laugh with people now and I can cry with people now and we've built some wonderful friendships over the years and people believe in you and I think this is the, the biggest thing for me, people believe in you, they listen to you, and they don't ignore you. And that's what DEEP is all about. They're so caring. They really are. It's absolutely brilliant. Well, that's a fantastic endorsement. Can you remember, Gail, the first time that you spoke to somebody at DEEP, or maybe some bit of information that somebody at DEEP gave you, or something personal that somebody told you that just made a connection with you? I think there's, there's been um, many people, because of the groups, um, there's always been about eight people within those groups, and everybody gives you different advice. Um, whether you take the advice is, is up to you. Yeah. But it's, it's very good advice. Um, because everybody's in the same boat. Um, we're all going on, on, the, on a very similar journey. It's not the same, but it's very similar. And some people have been living with dementia a lot longer than what I have. So, yeah, um, I think Wendy once gave me some advice of just do what you want to do. Do what you makes you happy. And I think that's been... One of the best pieces of advice because yeah. it's what I want to do. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that makes absolute sense. And um, I've got to put it to you, George, um, that you are the only male member of the Four Amigos. Now, um, what what is that like? <laughs> Perhaps you ought to ask them. Um, it's, it's <laughs> honestly, I am, I am an honorary woman anyway, so oh, good. Uh, it, okay. it's, it's absolutely fine. I, I don't particularly like football and I don't conform to the male stereotype. Sorry. Um, that's on, gone national now, so I'll probably live to regret <laughs> that. Oh, don't um, worry. But I, 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 we just, we just, we have become such good friends. We know each other so well. We just say things as, as will probably become clear. Um, we, we we just pick each other up, you know, like Dory hasn't yet told us what um, what her favourite plant is from uh, from her the time when she was um, landscape gardening. But that will come. Um, uh, I mean, Gail is the most remarkable crafter. Um, yeah. uh, she can learn and do and excel at anything you put in front of her. Uh, and, she, and by the time we sort of half mastered it, she's on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just incredible. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that, that, that I think has come out very clearly to me uh, in the last three years is about the fact that we may have dementia, our brains may be a bit porous in places, but we can still learn stuff. And no one out there believes we can. They think, you know, what was I told when I was uh, diagnosed? Um, don't take any risks, don't get tired, prepare for the future. Uh, in other words, plan your death. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, that's a pretty depressing thing to be told. So um, we, we, we ignore that advice as much as we possibly can. Hence Wendy's broken wrist and um, oh, I don't know what else we ever get up to. Um, being the only man in the group doesn't fuss me at all. Uh, I mean, there are lots of men in other groups. Um, it okay. just happens that this this has just been a a, a happy uh, confluence of tributaries. Right. Um, and what about in in lockdown, George? How significant was it? Yeah. Oh God. It, you know, we 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 didn't use to use Zoom because we didn't have to, and all of a sudden 
we found that we could meet each other every week uh, and sometimes even more than once a week and um and we just we just could, could matter um and um i mean as gail said we had a, a monday fun day group uh, where we just used to do silly things and jokes and dress up and whatever else just for the sake of it nothing else at all um and we got to know each other so much better than and then when we were just meeting every you know four or five months um in person having sort of traipsed around the country to a conference um and i i i think Wendy pretty much said this earlier but what i have made the best friends of my life in the last three years i mean i i, I started going to deep stuff about six or seven years ago um by by happy coincidence i just met someone who said come to this conference in Landudno. And I thought, well, I'm not that old yet, but I'll go anyway. And um, uh, and it and it just worked. And from then on, I, I engaged with stuff that deep and deep groups were doing. But um, where was I going with that? Don't worry. Yeah, I've made the best friends I've ever had. Yeah. Yes. Well, and that's not insignificant, is it? Um, oh God, it's huge. It's huge. Because yeah. you know, it's we. Over the thing is, I can just sort of tumble out of bed like I did this morning, late, um, thinking, um, "Oh God, how am I going to wake up in time?" And I just trundle onto this, and and we just come alive when we yes, when we yes. push that magic button. Yeah, mm. no, it's noticeable. The connection between the four of you is is I, I can I can sense it, and it's brilliant. Um, Dory, you better tell us now about your is your favourite plant. I, I'm <laughs> desperate to know what is it. It's not my favourite plant, George. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's a plant that I came across when I was landscaping, and it's called, and this is true, George didn't believe me, <laughs> Cockburnianus. Right, well, I don't believe that either, so uh, we'll move but on. It's, a raspberry. it's true. It's true. It's a raspberry, a type of raspberry cane. Oh, is it a raspberry cane? No, I don't know. I just knew it was funny, Gail. Oh, Dory. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, but well... Uh, we Google it, and it, it is true. Right. That's what it's called. And I think um, that's an example of where Jane would be pulling her hair out if we were on Radio 4. Yeah, I was just yeah. thinking, actually, what a profound relief in any number of ways it is that I'm not still doing more than <laughs> Anyway, there you go. Um... <laughs> What um, about lockdown and the pandemic and, and your approach to it, Dory? I mean, what would it have been like for you if you hadn't had these connections with the people you've met through Deep? It would be, I would have been very isolated because I live by myself. And in the lockdown, you know, before I was travelling at quite a lot of places and that all came to an end. So. I think dementia would have uh, took over me a bit more without the Zooms and meeting friends. You know, the Zoomettes, we had the Zoomettes. Yes, yeah. The four and amigos and... i tell you what, yeah. can I just interrupt? I, I think what we all find so <laughs> brilliant about the meeting together is the smiles the the laughter and the smiles and that if you get if you if you meet a, a really genuine good smiley laughter uh, once a day you'll have a happy life because it just regenerates all that stuff that's going on inside you yes and without that you can become very down and if you've got mm -hmm. dementia you can get even further down so it's as much about just smiling and seeing smiles as anything else regularly. Can I ask you, Dory, you met, thank you, George. Uh, Dory, you mentioned living alone. I wonder whether, well, you'll have to just answer this. I, I can't answer for you. Is it easier to live alone with dementia or is it tougher if you're in a partnership or, or the other way around? Um, 
sorry, my question didn't make much sense, but what is it like no, as a person living alone with it? I find it's better because you haven't got somebody else coming, moving stuff. Yeah. You know where things are. Yeah. And I can, if I want to go out, I'll go out where I think, well, I know people with partners um, who wouldn't, they disable them. They stop them doing things only because they care, but they're actually disabling the person. So even if I burn some dinners, it doesn't matter. It's, a, it's only my dinner. It wouldn't be a hubby's dinner or... <laughs> Right. So. Uh, OK, thank you. Um, Wendy, I know that you also live. I think you do live alone. I think your daughter is close, isn't she? But not in the same place. Yeah, absolutely. I, I in the words of one of my playmates from Minds and Voices, it's sheer luxury living alone. <laughs> Simply because for me, I have to find a way to overcome the challenges that dementia throws at me because there's no one else to do it for me so it it forces me into that situation where I'm trying to outwit dementia mm -hmm. and, and as Dory said for the kindest of reasons people start doing things for you it's an instant automatic reaction from people you know it's nothing unusual but for people with dementia that kindness can be the worst thing you can do because my daughters when I first moved into this house they started putting my coat on and I began to realize when I was at home alone I was getting confused putting my arms in my own coat and I said to them, if you continue to put on my coat, you're going to have to come to my house every single time I want to go out for a walk. And they stopped immediately because they were disabling me for, through kindness. Yeah. And I, it doesn't matter if I take an hour. It doesn't matter if. I take two hours to do anything. I'm doing it myself. Yes. And dementia strips away so yep. much from you that just having that little bit of self-respect to be able to do some things yourself is huge with dementia. Anything small. Thank you, Wendy. Can I, can I ask you, Gail? You live with your partner, don't you? So... What is that like? How does that work for you both? Yeah, um, obviously it was a big shock when I got my diagnosis. I was only um, 54 um, and we'd moved here to retire and do lots of things. So it was a big shock to the system. Um, Hubby, I might add, is absolutely brilliant. Mm. He lets me get on with it. And um, it doesn't interfere with what I'm doing until I need him. And I'm normally at screaming point by then, so he knows anyway if I can't do something. Um, but it, it's also, I have a terrible feeling of guilt and that comes and goes quite often because um, <clears throat> when you're with a partner and you was retiring together and you'd all these um, things that you wanted to do, and there's certain things that we can't do now. We try and do what we can. Um, we've just had to adapt and, and change things slightly. But I still feel that as, as I start to de deteriorate and progress, um, will I hold my hubby back from doing what he, what I think should be doing? Um, so I do have that guilt of, our retirement is not what it was going to be. But um, now I try to look at things positively that we we are still doing things together yes. and we can still do things. Um, yeah, so 
it, it's just accepting it's acceptance I was really interested in what Wendy said about her daughters helping her on with her coat and the fact that in the end she she said to them stop stop doing this and now she does it herself in her own time uh, do you recognize that is that something that has happened in your life that you've had um, to stop somebody helping you no not really I'm quite a strong person I've always been <laughs> quite independent and people that know me anyway know that I'm very independent so um I think people wait for me to ask them um but I'm not very good at asking for help that is my other downfall I don't like to ask for help I muddle along and a lot of people, uh, in, well, George certainly said he'd made the best friends of his life um, as part of the, his association with Deep. Can I ask you about your friends from the rest of your life? How how are they around your diagnosis and how are they with you now? Um, I only have one friend now. Um, it's, it, it's funny when you get that diagnosis, um, the majority of, of friends slowly deteriorate and stop contacting you and stop calling round and stop phoning you it did bother me and it did upset me but then when I found the deep I got lots of new friends mm. and it's a different kind of friendship it's a deeper friendship because mm. the the people that you can trust um yeah, yeah the, the you can share anything with anybody from the deep and you know that you can trust them. And that means an awful lot um, to have a friendship like that is just wonderful. So the fact that I've lost friends, to me, it's their loss because I've gained lots of new friends. Thank you. That's, that's sad though, that other people do seem to have let you down, but as you say, their loss. Um, George, what about your, your friendship group? How have they reacted? Um, <laughs> I'm going to be uh, candid here and say I didn't have a very much of a friendship group. Uh, I'm a, a little bit of a loner in life, I suppose. And um, uh, I, uh, I, my friends are probably basically my garden and my dog. Um, so, uh, I mean, in terms of neighbours, though, the few neighbours that are live live near me um yeah they they've tended to um be frightened of ever mentioning anything and uh, and and keep away more than they used to um no i mean i i may maybe i i god i don't know what i'm gonna say here um no i don't know sorry what? No, not at all. Uh, what What about, uh, I'm really interested in the point of, of partners and people who love and care for you, yeah. trying to help, perhaps though sometimes doing too much. Is that, well, is that something that you've come up against, George? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, my wife is um, very, <laughs> you know, I'll say the usual things about her being very understanding and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and she is, but nevertheless, she does things the way she she's used to doing them. So she clears things away, um, put them in places that I don't, can't find them. Um, um, and, and I keep saying, look, please just always return things to the same place. Mm. But she, it doesn't seem to quite click. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, um, and then when I asked, she said, well, have you looked? <laughs> and I said, yes, sometimes, I have to admit the things were in the right place and I just didn't see them. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the um, symptoms, uh, classic symptoms, is when you look, for, look at something and don't see it. And then you turn around, come back two minutes later, you do see it. Uh, so that can be quite um, stressful for both sides. Uh, I mean, I, I, in terms of whether I prefer to live on my own with this disease or not, then I'd, I'd have to say I wouldn't prefer to live on my own. Um, just because I'm not that sort of person, I like to have someone around. Um, um, but it is a source of stress for both sides, without doubt. 
Well, thank you all very much um, for talking so honestly and also um, with, well, just, just frankly uh, about everything you've been going through. And um, if anybody was offended by Dory's plant reference, by the way, I'm sure there's a complaint line that you can ring up um, and we'll, we'll sort that out. Um, I've certainly learned a thing or two again this morning. So I'm just going to bring Philly back in, um, if that's all right. But um, lovely to talk to all of you, Dory and George and Gail and Wendy. You're all absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for taking part this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is so powerful. Thank you all so much. And we can't see all the people who are with us, but we can see um, some of the comments in the chat coming in. Absolutely wonderful. This is really striking so many chords. And, and as with everything connected with deep, it's always, always a wonderful mixture of the moving, the sad, the shocking, and the wonderful, and the joyful, and the loving all those things coming through, and that is what DEEP is about. So we're gonna turn the tables a little bit now. And yeah. I know each of the four amigos has got a question that they'd like to ask Jane. And um, Wendy, I hope yeah. I've just put in yeah. there. Yeah, uh, don't, don't uh, panic, George. Philly will send you a, a message, because she's oh, just done that for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, so Jane. When, would you like to ask your question? Jane, yes. what has most surprised you since you first met people, people living with dementia? Since your first meetings, what has surprised you most? Well, I think it's probably important if I sort of um, make it clear who I am and where I'm from. So I'm 58 and um, my parents are still alive. They are 88 and 89 and neither of them have dementia, although inevitably they are they are getting frailer. And I, as a small child, was aware of an elderly aunt of mine who had dementia, but it wasn't really talked about. This was the 1970s, and it was something that we all just gently pretended wasn't actually happening to the to the poor woman. And I think the conversation around all all sorts of things have changed so much during my lifetime particularly during my working life that it does feel that the conversation around dementia is getting more honest and it's getting franker but it's still something as i said at the beginning that people are very fearful of and all of you this morning have been very clear that when you first got your diagnosis it was frankly a very frightening set of circumstances but i I mentioned to a friend of mine this morning that I was doing this session today and she she literally the lovely woman but her first reaction was just to say oh poor you that's going to be terrible and I said no <laughs> no actually it, no you don't understand it isn't because these people are astonishingly articulate and they know so much stuff and she sort of looked at me as though I'd just gone completely completely crackers and I think that's the thing I'm so passionate about. I think people outside this conversation would be amazed, to be really honest with you, they would be amazed by how articulate and funny and clever you all are. Um, and I think that is the thing that really, I wish more people were taking part so they could see and hear what you are all capable of. I think I, I, sorry, so, sorry, Jane, go on. No, you go on. I was just going to say, I think people, when they think, when they hear the word dementia, they, they, they believe it all happens at once. Yes, yeah. And in fact, you know, there is still a beginning, a middle and an end. There, yeah. there is still is life to be lived. And that's, that's the one thing I want people to hear, that when you're diagnosed, it doesn't all happen at once. And that's that's what I think your friends with images in their head. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. No, I mean honestly, um, I think I mean I think it's also worth saying, and you would acknowledge this too, Wendy, that I remember you telling me that you were before your diagnosis quite a self-effacing, rather quiet person. Um yeah. who who probably Kept did that that classic cliche kept herself to herself. I did, and now you're you know your best-selling author, public speaker, 
and George called you, I think, the Queen of Dementia earlier. This is this is an my, extraordinary um, journey that you've been on, to use that expression. My girl, my daughters call call me a gregarious alien because they obviously <laughs> knew the past me. And yes, the, but I quite like this new me. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people do. Thank you, Wendy. My my question, Jane, was in the world of presenting, do you think the perception, stigma around the D word, dementia, is changing? Are people becoming more aware that dementia can affect any age? Well, I really hope they are. Um, I'm sure that there was a lot of interest from Deep last week in the new drug for Alzheimer's, which which got an enormous amount of publicity and which I did do a relatively brief interview about on Times Radio. And the it, it does sound like this might be a breakthrough, this, this new drug, which is obviously in development, not yet available in the UK, maybe many, many years away. But I was interested because I now work with colleagues, most of whom are in their early 20s at the Times radio station. And they're all great, enthusiastic young people, but they thought dementia really was only something that the over 80s would have to be worried about. They were really surprised when I told them that people of my age and younger can be diagnosed with it. And I do think there's an enormous amount of education still to be done, I'm afraid. I think there was a film a couple of years ago, um, Still Alice with Julianne Moore, mm -hmm which I think did, which is, she was a great, she's a great actress and it was a, a brilliant film and a, an outstanding performance. And I think that may have altered a few minds, but people, you know, films come and go and the conversation moves on. So I still think there's a great deal of education to be done, I'm afraid. Things have got better and groups like Deep are doing everything they can to get rid of the stigma and to be more open and transparent about dementia. But there's still a lot of people who, either don't know which questions to ask or are they're too frightened to ask any at all, actually, is the truth. And I, I do think, Gail, that the diagnosis in your 50s is something that most people know absolutely nothing about, mm -hmm. which I imagine, if I could be, go back to you, if you don't mind, is, is possibly why some of your friends, who presumably were around the same age as you, you know, they weren't able to cope. They didn't yeah. know what they didn't know what to say or do. That that that's just it. They don't know what to say to you, and they don't know what to do. But the thing is, we just want to be treated as we've always been treated. We just want to be treated the same, same as anybody else. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I appreciate that, but I think it's the rest of us who've got to. We've just got to man and woman up, actually, and and get over our get over our fear because that's what it is. Yeah. Thank you. you mention, and I don't know whether Rachel is able to find this and put it in the uh, in the chat, but Wendy wrote um, a really powerful blog just a couple of days ago about the way that the new drug is being hailed. Um, so I don't know if you can find that, Rachel, and put that in the chat. That's, and you were making the point, Wendy, that um, everybody's very excited about... Uh, <laughs> A new drug, but actually, there's there's uh, a million people who already have dementia in the UK. Oh, yeah, drug yeah. will mean nothing for them, and we need to be putting resources into support and peer support, and uh, all the all the other things which can help to make life still be meaningful. That's right. I think I, I think I was actually on Times Radio with some of your colleagues, Jane. Yes, I'm, yes, and you they, were. Yeah, they. You know, I was saying how I've become optimistic, optimistically pessimistic when I hear these breakthrough he headlines, simply because I've been hearing them for so long. And the, the actual drug will only treat those with purely Alzheimer's. Yes, yeah. And that excludes a huge number of people. So although it's wonderful, you know, that they haven't forgotten us. It's, you know, we still need the social and technological research to help us living with the condition. Yeah. Uh, can I just come in and say, I, I think 
Uh, there's another issue with this drug, and, and that is that it's only available, it will only work with people diagnosed very, very early. And most yes. people are not diagnosed um, early enough for it. Yeah. So it's, there, there is, it's a great start and, and maybe the, the gateway to a lot of other things. <clears throat> Did you want to put your question to Jane, George? Well, I, I, think, <laughs> I think the question was about what surprised you most. And I think Jane's probably answered it already. So um, what surprised you most, Jane? About, uh... <laughs> it is worth saying that I am genuinely surprised by, um, yeah. by I have to say the thing that I remember when I came to the meeting a couple of years ago in, in London, uh, I seem to remember that day was very hot, which is quite hard to imagine now, but um, it was a very hot afternoon. And the first thing I heard as I walked into the room was the sound of laughter. Mm. And that hadn't been what I was expecting. I yeah. was actually a bit nervous. I was a bit cross with myself for having agreed to come, if I'm honest. Um, and I think we often in our lives say, oh, yes, I'll do that. Um, and then you the day actually dawns and you think, oh, God, you know, why? Why did I say I'd do that? And if I'm really honest and everybody's been so honest today, I know I can be. I did feel that way that day. But as soon as I heard the laughter, I thought, oh, actually, um, this is probably going to be all right. And mm. uh, I think we'll have I think we'll have a good time today. Mm. And we did. Um, and the idea that a diagnosis of dementia means that you sit, you simply sit in silence, awaiting your fate. Mm. Um, that's the hurdle that we all we need to get over. It isn't like that. There'll be some very tough and challenging times, mm. but with the help of good friends and, and partner, if, you, if you're in that situation and, and organisations like Deep, you know, they, it, it's not all doom and gloom. There'll, there'll be some good times and some good days as well. Yeah, and I, th I think, uh, I mean, to take that a bit further, <clears throat> that what what we tend to find in our, in the deep groups around the country is that we learn most from the other people in the group. Because so, all of us all of us know know some stuff about oh, it might be about benefits, it might be about council tax, it might yeah. be about. Um, your symptoms, whatever. And I keep finding that I find out from someone else about something I didn't didn't know, didn't realize, and they find out from me. So we are our best um, support and best, probably for most of us, the only real support that we get and for that matter need in the first, I don't know, two thirds of our journey. Um, which could be, I, I say two thirds, because it could be two years, it could be 20 years. And George, is there anything you'd be afraid to say when you meet up with your other amigos? Is there, are there topics you wouldn't discuss in, or is nothing off limits? Um, I think there's probably one topic that we don't go anywhere near. Um, but other than that, uh, everything is, Every, everything and anything. I mean, ob obviously, me being a bloke and and them being women um, means that they are not going to mention certain things, and I'm not going to mention certain things. Um, but we just don't go there, so it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. I mean, my, the group I have in um, in in Shrewsbury, we are um, I think it's seven seven eighths men and one eighth woman, and um, so when the woman doesn't turn up, we do sometimes stray a little bit into male stuff, but um, uh, you've got to know each other very, very well before you start instigating sort of ideas about sex and stuff at, at our age. So uh, it, is, it is the great untalked of. No, yeah. there are two great untalked of, sex and death. And we really need to talk about them both mm. more. Yeah, I just don't want to be the first person to do it. No, I don't. I get that, George. Believe me, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it, but it's it's. I'm glad you have mentioned it because it, it's not like these issues aren't important. Um, yeah, because right. you know they clearly are. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dory, you wanted to. Oh, can we just let Wendy come in first? I can see you waving. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I should have noticed sorry. Wendy. 
on the subject of death, <laughs> my my third and final book. Oh God, I knew you should do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's called sorry, one sorry, last Wendy, time. I talked over you there. When is your and book coming out? I do go through June. <laughs> but if we do, and I interviewed the four amigos about the subject as well. The, you know the future planning. So I, I, I'm so passionate about the. Destigmatizing the world of death as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, Dory, your 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 question to Jane. Yeah, I don't know whether Jane's answered this already, but before did your has your perception of dementia before meeting the meeting in London? Has it altered since meeting? I would say it definitely had, has altered. And I would say it's, it's altered for the better, but it's made me realise what a complicated set of circumstances it is mm -hmm. and how very varied experiences of dementia are. And, you know, I mean, you are, the four of you are a fairly extraordinary bunch of people regardless of your dementia diagnosis. You've all had interesting working lives. Um, stuff has happened to you. You've done things, you've been to places. Um, you're, you're not for ordinary people by any stretch of the imagination. And now you have dementia, but that isn't what defines you. Mm. It's it's what you are currently living with. Mm. And, and frankly, who knows what lies ahead for me or for the people I, I care for. But I would now, having met some of you and spoken to all of you, I would not be anywhere near as fearful of a diagnosis mm. of dementia if I were to get one. Mm. Um, I, I really wouldn't be. And I, I think you should all pat yourselves on the back for that because that's, I'm not talking about the impact just on me, but if, if more people like me could see and hear from you, I think you'd spread that reassurance. Because and, and that's exactly why we do the Four Amigos films, because we yeah. want people just to sit back, relax and and learn a bit, but also just have a bit of listen to a bit of fun, yeah. banter. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Dory. there's. Go on, Wendy. No, oh, Dory had the card up. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Locally to me, I'd met other deep groups around different parts of the country, but there wasn't any deep groups locally to me. So, and I just thought that was a real shame because people were missing out on this friendship and peer support. There was memory cafes, but they all seem to concentrate on the older generation, should I say. Yeah. And the people that go enjoy them, but there was nothing for the younger on set. Um, and so I set up my own group that I'm called Like-Minded, and it's growing and the people that come say, they're so pleased they came along. And we talk about everything in continents, all sorts. And we're a mixed group, but in continents affects men, you know, as well. So we have these discussions. And we we tell them how well. long, Dory, tell, tell Jane how long it took you and how many visits <laughs> to the park you had to make. Yeah. Well, before lockdown, I sat set it up in a pub early yeah. evening, and for nine months, I sat there every Thursday night on my own with a glass of wine, just waiting for somebody to come. And I started to get a bit of a reputation. <laughs> <laughs> but then... One night, 
a lady come through the door and she and at the end she lived alone with dementia and um she said oh i'm so glad i came i didn't know what to expect but it's been like a proper night out hasn't it and then it grew and grew and um it was good for her for everyone because she was saying that things were happening to her and I was able to share oh that yes that happens to me and she said she was so pleased because she thought she was the only one that this was happening to and we all have different things but a lot of very common yes yeah and mm. um, so i'm so then lockdown came and the pub shut and people sort of went off the radar but i've started another one now at the mold rugby club called like-minded and i think we're going to need a bigger boat soon yeah why, why didn't you call it moldy oldies <laughs> I, I just wanted to 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 mention um, the deep values, which I think uh, are really essential to to the way we we all well work together, meet together, whatever. Because because um, Dory mentioned um, those things that that are called dementia cafes, and uh, and they 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 well they're very varied, but but the thing about these deep groups is that we decide what we want to do and we pretty much organize what what we do we have some help periodically from others um but that is just purely facilitation and 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 what i spend some of my time doing is trying to persuade um organizations to run groups that are like deep groups instead of putting on activities for us uh, which we probably don't want and which only you know you, you name an activity which applies to all 10 people in a group of 10, um, which they want to do, you won't get them. Um, uh, so so we, we just meet socially, and if we want to do other things, we'll say it. Like my, my group wants to go indoor bowling. Um, so we'll probably go indoor bowling. Um, just, it's not not because we didn't enjoy bowling, because it's just an opportunity to have a bit more fun and throw balls around. And um, we've got a few questions coming in. Oh, just to mention that Rachel's put up the link to the deep values. So do have a look at those. Oh, those, are the, those are the things that underpin all the groups across the country. There's about 80 groups now. Is that right, right Rachel? Yeah. So if there isn't one in your area, just go and sit in a pub and advertise <laughs> it like Dory did. And there will be one yeah. eventually. <laughs> Um, so questions, um, these are actually for the four amigos, not for you, Jane, but <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, what are the things you wish you were told or wish you had, um, had input from services when you were first assessed and diagnosed? I think we'll just maybe go for one thing each in the interest of time. Can I go to Wendy and then Dory? Well, I, I will just say, I wish I'd been told that, no, there's nothing that they can do for me, but concentrate on what you can do. There's still much, so much life out there still to be lived. Go and live it. Thank you. And oh, sorry. Same as Wendy, really. It's not what we can't do. It's what we can still do. And just hand out some hope. Yeah. Instead of giving you this death sentence, which is what they did. Gail. Yeah, I think if if the medical professional made it more of a positive experience rather than a negative experience, let's focus on the things that we still can do. Don't tell us that we can't do because we can. Yeah. George, did you have so one? I'd add um, the thing I tend to say to people is uh, you're still the same person you were yesterday. 
just because you've got mm. a diagnosis. That's just a snapshot of your journey, which, I mean, remember, dementia is in your head, the disease, for 20 to 30 years very often before you actually have the symptoms sufficient to actually trigger you to go to the doctor. Mm. So it's a very, very long, slow process for most of us. Mm. So just remember, you're exactly the same. Continue to do what you enjoy, do new things you enjoy, and just go on living. Mm. Could I just say as well that we can learn new things because I couldn't draw even matchstick men before mm. and then Lady Frances Isaacs who lives with dementia who's a very good artist during lockdown did videos teaching us how to use watercolours and I mean, I don't think mine are brilliant, but I'm very proud of them, really. Yeah, me so, too. There's yeah, a few of us. I'd like to thank Francis. Yeah. Yeah. You want to reflect back on any of that, Jane? Well, I, I, I just think it's it's fantastically, it's so interesting. And, I, you know, to go back to what I said after my first a trip to your meeting, it, it, it's life enhancing to hear about. I mean, I... I'm absent, I haven't got an artistic bone in my body. And I love the idea that Dory was able to do something new um, at yeah. such a challenging time for all of us during the lockdown. That must have been amazing. But also listening to George talk about how gifted Gail is as a crafter as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that not only is Gail really skilled, but that George is able to say how much he values her skill set. It's just a, it, I've just got a real sense of your very genuine and important friendship this morning. Yeah. I, I hope everybody else has as well. I think it's honestly, I think it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I really do. And Gail did some videos as well um, and taught us how to do card making and other right. things. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, we, we've done a lot of stuff called, we call it craft, craftivism. Uh, and we've done all sorts of things in order to, in a sense, well, primarily to enjoy them, but also to demonstrate to people that actually we can still learn things, we can still do them, we are still quite capable, it's just a small bit of our brain has stopped to work, stopped working. Mm -hmm. And you've got something to show us there, Rachel, that Gail made. Yeah. Uh, it's one of Gail's children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Anybody else got anything they made that they want to hold up? Very sweet. Yeah. yeah. George, have you got any of your beautiful woodwork around the place? Um, yeah, not the woodwork. Work? I've got a painting. Oh, God, we're going to lose them all now. Oh, that's lovely. Hey, wonderful. And like you, Jane, oh. I, <clears throat> well, I was told all my life I hadn't got an ounce of, um, of artistic ability and um, I've now found it. Right, there you go, fantastic. Yeah, I, think, I think so many of us was, was told whether, when we were at school that we couldn't do things or that we wasn't good enough. And as we've got um, older and obviously we, we've got dementia, um, we have more time on our hands. So what's not better to do but to find something that we yeah. want to learn? And the yeah. thing is, people should give us the chance to learn. It might take us longer. They might have to repeat themselves quite a few times, but we do get it in the end. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'd like to say a big thank you. I know we are deep the people with dementia, but I'd like to thank the deep organisation uh, network. Yeah, yeah. You, Philly, Rachel Litherland, Rachel Nidblock, Damien, Steve, who give us the opportunities to do all these things and give us the confidence and support us mm -hmm. to do them. Innovations in dementia is a, you know, after you, Wendy. They're the only people that I will do thing for. 
but that's how much trust I have in them because they they go that just extra mile to make things happen for you yeah. and mm. without that we can't you know without their leadership if you like their enablership we we would flounder on our own with a lot of things mm. so they <coughs> enable us to do so much more ever ever could and I, and I find the contrast between the way innovation and dementia people run meetings and and help us to uh, find new things the contrast between that and and working with other groups um who who don't really get it and who who can't run meetings so for us they run them for them um it's remarkable you, you guys are fantastic. You just have the right values and empathy and emotional intelligence and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everyone. This has been a wonderful... We'll expect the, death love the post. post. Yes, yeah, sounds post. like it. Jane, I'm going to leave you to, uh, to wind up for a minute or two. And um, yeah, just finish us off, please. Right, thank you, Philly. And thanks to everybody who's taken part today. Um, once again, I'm going to leave a session involving Deep feeling much more positive than when I started it. Um, it's a horrible, grey, cold day here in London. Mm -hmm. And um, like a lot of people, I've got quite a few things on my mind. Who hasn't at the moment? Uh, but honestly, you have all really, really um, made a difference to my day in a, in a positive way. Um, it's been really lovely to see Dory and to see Wendy again and to chat to George and to Gail. I'm hugely impressed by everything you're doing. And I just hope you all keep smiling, keep talking to each other and just keep making a difference. Thank you all so much for taking part today. Mm -hmm.